Today, I am talking with an OBGYN, obstetrician gynecologist, about all the things. So many of you ask questions on my Instagram, and now I'm going to ask the hard questions. We're talking about sex. We're talking about arousal, squirting, UTIs. Then we're talking about vaginas. What's normal? What's not normal? Should we be doing va vaginal weightlifting? Can a lack of sex be bad for a vagina um, and our health in general? We talk about sex toys. We talk about contraceptions. What's the best? What to be careful of? We talk about PCOS, endometriosis, fertility, pregnancy, giving birth, what we should be eating, and so much more. Today, I have the privilege of talking to Dr. Jamie Seaman. She's a working OBGYN, also a mum. She was on Titans on NBC, a successful podcaster herself on the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Mrs. Nebraska 2020, welcome Dr. Jamie Seaman. Luke, it's such it's such an honor for you to lose your podcasting virginity uh, by having me as your first guest. I Thank couldn't you. think of anyone better to have on and what a hot topic. The first thing I wanted to dive into was sex, uh, because what else is there to talk about? What, is, what else is better to talk about? And my opening question, by the way, all the questions have come from other people. None of these are from me. This is the first question for you. Is squirting a real thing? So the vagina has a lot of glands that lubricate the vagina. So there's some right at the opening, kind of at the bottom of the vagina. There's some Bartholin's glands. There's a Skeen's gland up by the top. The cervix itself makes a lot of uh, lubrication. It has a lot of mucus glands. And so there's lots of things that provide lubrication. And squirting is essentially um, the fluid that's coming from those glands. It is a thing. Now, certainly, if you go to the interwebs, there's a lot of debate about people, whether it's urine. And of course, the urethra, a lot of people don't understand female anatomy, but the urethra sits just outside the vaginal opening, about a centimeter or two above that or what we call superior in medical language. And so certainly it's plausible that a woman could be losing urine, but when you have any sort of sexual arousal or orgasm, these glands secrete liquid and that lubrication is part of the arousal, um, the, the physiologic arousal process. And so, yes, I mean, some women make lots and some make less and it's completely normal. Um, the question, the whole question this person asked was, is squirting a real thing or does my husband just want to be pissed on? <laughs> I mean, I think that sometimes people always think of things synonymously to like male parts. And obviously most women aren't going to have an ejaculation like men do, which is such a visual thing, you know, for a lot of people. And so I don't think women should be like, there's something wrong with me or there's something broken. Like I can't do this thing that they're talking about it's just it's just part of normal arousal it seems like something that pop culture has influenced and made women feel a bit insecure about if their partner's asking them to do it right well just i mean women are made to feel insecure about a lot of things and part of that is because a lot of times women like the marketing for feminal like feminine hy fem feminal feminal <laughs> female hygiene products it's very, um, we were talking about this right before we started recording, like it makes women feel like they're dirty or icky or they market things with like scent, like that there's something wrong with women. And so I think when it comes to a lot of those things, it's just the way that society has really portrayed female sexual anatomy. Like for instance, on my social media, I work with companies, you know, that uh, like vibrators and sex toys because a lot of women can't orgasm from penetrative intercourse. And it is incredible to see the messages that come in. Some people are like, oh my God, that's disgusting. You're going to hell. And then all the way to a male partner who's like, thank you. I bought this for my wife. She experienced the best orgasm she's ever experienced. This has really like made our sexual relationship so much better. So it's just it's a it's it's incredible the stigma that's out there surrounding female sexual health. I wanted to talk to you about uh, that. I want to talk to you about Vush or is it Bush? Yeah, Bush. Uh, that uh, this 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 vibrator that I saw on your on your page that um, that sucks the clitoris. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a clever marketing technique. There's a lot of new sex toys out um, that it. Only about 10% of women can orgasm from penetrative intercourse. And so a lot of times women need vulvar and clitoral stimulation. And the clitoris actually, most people think of it as like this little 
dot right above the urethra, right? Like it's this little tiny piece of erogenous tissue, but the clitoris actually extends down along the anterior vagina and down along the labia. So, you know, the, the labia majora and labia minora. And so there's all this tissue in there that actually just like a male would get an erection, the clitoris actually erects with female sexual arousal. And these sex toys, they don't actually suck because that would be kind of dangerous if it was actually like vacuuming onto the tissue. And I know they use words like that from a marketing perspective, but a lot of times it's actually just blowing air or sound waves to actually stimulate the tissue. And some women think it's too intense. So it's giving you a blow. Um, The one that I, yeah, but the one that I, you know, have on my social media, it has like 40 different settings. So everything from, you know, a little bit to a lot of it and pulsing or constant stimulation because different strokes for different folks. <laughs> True. I just want to really get that joke across that I said that I feel was slightly ignored. Um, it's it, that, that thing is giving you a blow job, the bush. Yeah. Yeah, basically. And part of their, you know, marketing is that, you know, about self-love, I think like masturbation, when you talk about stigma, is that that it's like an abnormal thing. But when you look at, uh, you know, normal development, little boys touch their penis at a very young age. It's very normal for little girls to do the exact same thing. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, at that point, you don't, you don't have this construct of like right or wrong, right? You're like, I touched my body here and it feels good. And the brain's like, that's good. Do it again. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we tell little girls like, don't touch your private parts. Don't do that, you know, in public don't have sex till marriage. And I just think that girls get such a skewed view of their bodies and what their bodies are capable of. And most women don't even know what their own vulva looks like. Like they're afraid to look at it with a mirror. You know, we offer women mirror in childbirth. Like, do you want to see the baby come out? And they're like, Oh, Oh God, no. Like, no, I don't ever want to see that. It's like, this is literally your body part. Like, you know, it's no different than like your brain or your heart or your face or your left hand. Mm. Um, So women should really, look at their own anatomy. If you want to use, you know, toys like this for stimulation, it's a great thing to explore your own body and to know what feels good to you. Because if you don't know that when you're by yourself alone, um, how could you ever communicate it with a partner? And so I just think it's super important for women to explore their own bodies and whether it's with your hands or with a mirror or using, you know, stimulation techniques. Love it. Um, Is it, uh, another question I've got here is, is it normal to be aroused but not have the famous WAP? Meaning, uh, for those of you who don't know out there, WAP means wet vagina. Yeah. So there's lots of stages of arousal. I mean, and um, particularly in women, when we talk about desire, so there's a difference between arousal and desire. Women to have women tend to have more um, responsive desire, like responsive arousal. They have to like see something that's stimulating or like smell or touch. Whereas men have more spontaneous desire and spontaneous arousal. Like men wake up with erections. Um, But yes, you can absolutely have arousal and not have lubrication. Okay, got it. Uh, Another question I fielded is, is it possible to stimulate your partner's G-spot by rubbing her belly? Well, the G spot is essentially, and this is my my personal medical opinion. So I talked about how the clitoris is actually much larger than what we see externally. So most of the clitoris is actually an internal organ that ex- extends along the anterior vaginal wall, which is where the you know famous G spot is, and that's basically because you stimulate that that vaginal tissue from the backside, so you're actually getting clitoral stimulation now. Um, anatomically speaking, I think you'd have to be pressing really hard on someone's belly (laughs) to put any sort of pressure on the pelvic floor. You could certainly, um, you could, you could access it, uh, through anal, you could access it vaginally. Um, I think you'd have a tough time. Maybe your partner is just really aroused by them touching your belly, or you can get arousal by touching the nipples. You know, you can get arousal a lot of ways. Some people like having their ears touched or their toes sucked or whatever it is, but you're probably not stimulating the G spot by rubbing someone's belly. Copy that. Sounds interesting though. Maybe we should explore it. Um, I wanted to ask you also, why do men struggle 
to find the clitoris, do you think? What's your theory? I have a theory. Well, women don't understand their own anatomy, so I can't imagine how men would. And, you know, what are they what are they seeing of female anatomy, right? Like, what are they being taught? Well, they're probably watching pornography or Googling it, right? And so a lot, it was funny when I went to medical school, we do anatomical dissections on cadavers. That's like the very first thing you do. You go down to this cadaver lab and, and you dissect. And there was some male counterparts, colleagues in these anatomical dissections that thought that women only had one hole, that they peed out of the same hole that they had sex with you know that the vagina and the urethra were one thing because that's what men have um but women don't (laughs) so the clitoris is actually even higher up than the urethra and so it's not necessarily right next to the vagina now certainly with penetrative intercourse you can get friction on the labia you can get friction on the clitoris but it's possible that you're getting no clitoral stimulation at all with penetrative intercourse and so um you know if you haven't looked in an anatomy textbook or looked at a woman's vulva um, to see actually how far away sometimes it could be, you know, you you got to look, you got to know. <laughs> yeah. So basically what you're saying is the same reason that a woman wouldn't be, a- be able to understand where her clitoris is, which most women don't. That's why a man wouldn't know because they haven't been taught and shown and educated essentially. Well, and there is actually a lot of misinformation, even amongst obstetrician and gynecologists when I'm talking about how large the clitoris actually is. It hasn't been reflected in anatomical pictures within textbooks or the posters that are in my gynecology office. Um, They actually don't show this from a pictorial perspective very well in a lot of written text. It's actually a new thing. There's a lot of people really advocating for this, um, especially as labiaplasties have become, you know, much more common. We have to really respect a woman's anatomy that there is a lot of erogenous arousal, you know, tissue there and we definitely don't want to damage anything um and certainly from a sexual satisfaction standpoint you want to know where those things are and the only way you know is by looking and exploring and touching and figuring out what feels good got it yeah so women should really get to know their bodies and then educate their partners if they don't if their partner probably doesn't know either right exactly it took me a long time to figure it all out I mean, your partner might be able to teach you something too. That's oh, that's, certainly that's the way that I, I, you know, I learned from a giving like open partner who was like, what are you doing? What's, what's the big idea here? And, you know, I, obviously you don't have any clue because, you know, previously to her was uh, a bunch of women who didn't know either and didn't, or, or weren't open to communicating what was going on. If I was, if I was doing the right thing or we were all having a good time, it didn't seem important, but then when I learned about that, I actually read a book. I read Bonk, B-O-N-K. It's a New York Times bestseller. And that described the importance of the clitoris. And I was like, oh, that is important? Because I think I just previously thought from watching porn that it's the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, the in and outs, the like how hard you're pressing in that like does it, right? So it was so interesting right. and world-changing, frankly, to learn. Yeah, yeah, because in men, right, they're – their tissues on the end of their penis. So you don't even have to stick it in very far to get a lot of stimulation of that tissue. But in women, you could have penetrative intercourse and and never really be getting good arousal. And a lot of women, honestly, um, who think that, who don't understand their own anatomy and clitoral stimulation, um, this is just my, my honest opinion, is a lot of women fake it because they're like, okay, well, I don't want to think that there's something wrong with my body. So I'm just going to I saw it in the porn and I'm going to, you know, tell them it feels good. And, Mm -hmm. and then they get these lopsided sexual relationships where they're not getting anything out of it and they're not communicating well with their partner. And I see that a lot in women. They have really low desire because they're not really getting what they want out of it. And they haven't communicated, you know, appropriately that, that they're not getting it. We have to talk about that more. Uh, Are you, are you posturing that? women can fake an orgasm in order to make themselves feel like their arousal is their lack of arousal is normal. Yeah. I think that a lot of people view sexual interactions like a performance. Like, I mean, you're an actor, right? You, you, I think we talked about this when I had you on my podcast, like acting out sex scenes, you know, I think that, um, people, whatever amount of information they consume, you know, when they're going through puberty and, and, um, 
they think they know what sex should look like, you know? And so I think that they don't want to be portrayed that they're not pleasing their partner. And so I, and I, and I know that a lot of women sometimes fake it because I, I hear women come into my clinic and talk about it, you Mm. know, and it just really comes down to how, you know, good is your relationship and communication and women also have to understand and men have to understand that a satisfying sexual relationship doesn't always mean sex. It doesn't mean penetrative intercourse. It doesn't mean penis in vagina. Like there's so many other things. And we've kind of highlighted that, that for female arousal, a lot of times you need other things besides penetrative intercourse. Yeah. Amazing. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, exercises for vaginas, uh, vaginal weightlifting. I'd never heard of, uh, vaginal exercises, pelvic floor exercises. What do you recommend? Well, I'm a huge fan of pelvic floor physical therapy, and a lot of people don't know that that's a thing. So just like if you hurt your shoulder and your doctor sent you to the physical therapist to rehab your shoulder, there's actually physical therapists that are specifically trained in pelvic floor rehab. So the pelvic floor um, is made up of connective tissue. So muscles, ligaments, tendons, just like all your other muscles in your body. And it kind of acts as almost like a trampoline. That's how I like to think about it. Or like a hammock. And all of your internal organs, you know, sit on this pelvic floor. And unfortunately, women who, you know, become pregnant in their lifetime or birth children or for a variety of reasons can have a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction or pelvic laxity. It can cause everything from um, sexual dysfunction um, to incontinence, so leakage of urine, fecal incontinence. And so with that, what you call it, vaginal weightlifting, is we can rehab this. So we can actually use biofeedback to help women strengthen these muscles. Um, And uh, there are some home devices, too, um, that I've shared on my social media. If you're too afraid to go to a physical therapist, there are things you can do at home. You can order what we call vaginal weights. But you have to understand how to contract these and you have to understand that they're also connected to your core. So the core and the pelvic floor and the diaphragm, think of like your belly, like there's a top, bottom and sides, right? And they all work in tandem. When you push on one, you know, you're pushing on the other side too. And so you have to understand how to like engage your core, how to engage your pelvic floor at the same time, how to relax it. So not only how to contract it, but how to relax it. But pelvic floor health is important for sexual function, for Um, just maintaining good function of your bowels and your bladder. Um, And it's something people don't even realize is a thing. So anyone out there right now who wants to look into this, they're looking for a pelvic floor therapist or what would it be called? What should they Google right now? Well, a lot of, there was some meme going around Instagram and they're like, when your gynecologist looks at your vagina, can they tell how jacked your pelvic floor is? You can't tell by looking. So when we're looking, we're just seeing the vulva. So if I just put a patient up in stirrups, all I'm seeing is the external structure. So the labia, maybe the clitoral hood, depending on how much of the labia covers that. Um, The vagina and the pelvic floor, I would actually have to do an internal exam. So we feel with our hands, the pelvic floor, we can actually feel these muscles, the iliococcygea. So these muscles basically connect the front and backs and sides of the pelvis. And there's a couple different muscles in there. And so you'd actually have to get an assessment by a pelvic floor physical therapist. So pelvic PT. So if you're like pelvic PT in my area or ask your doctor for a pelvic physical therapist in your area, there's some great accounts on social media that share really great content too. But to know if you have a problem, you'd have to like get an assessment because some people it's actually too tight. So we call that a high tone pelvic floor. They don't know how to relax those muscles. And those patients can have pain with intercourse Sometimes they can't even have penetrative intercourse um, or sometimes they have problems with like functional constipation because their pelvic floor is squeezing so tightly that they can't actually like release stool from their rectum. Wow. So some there's too tight and too loose and everything in, in between, but um, there's definitely people out there that can help. Okay. That's vital. I feel like that's vital information because a lot of people ask me about that. You know, somebody asked, <laughs> is it normal to pee a little bit when I'm jumping on the trampoline? <laughs> No, it's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I only laugh because my mom was like that. Things. You know, oh. I only laugh because it's not no judgment who anyone out there. My mom was like that when I used to, we used to wrestle her. I used to tickle her and she'd go, oh, I'm going to wet myself. <laughs> like it's a normal thing. Um, but I think the information you're giving is so important. Really hard. 
like if you laugh really hard or you jump really hard or you do something like, you know, traumatic, you can create a lot of intra-abdominal pressure that will push on the bladder and force urine out of the urethra. But a lot of the like dribbling leakage that women experience, a lot of it is due to pelvic floor dysfunction mm -hmm. from pregnancy or having babies. Some people even who have never been pregnant can have this type of incontinence, but there's two types of incontinence. So leakage, overactive bladder, that's when the bladder is squeezing because it's a muscle. It's called the detrusor muscle. So the bladder is actually spasming and pushing urine through the urethra or there's stress incontinence. And stress incontinence is like laugh, cough, sneeze, jump. And the reason that that happens is as the pelvic floor starts to sag, as the trampoline starts to sag down when it loses strength, it actually starts to straighten out the urethra. So the urethra and the bladder are supposed to have this specific angle that kind of kink it off. And it could be overcome by like really, really like robust laughter or something like that. But as the pelvic floor sags, it straightens out the urethra. And so it takes a, just a tiny amount of pressure to have leakage. Or sometimes people can have spontaneous leakage just with walking with standing upright got it that's uh i think feel like that's great information for a lot of people out there um let's talk about um utis from sex uh this is actually coming from me because i like a couple of months ago started getting utis whenever i would have sex and I was, and you know, I was like, what is going on? So what did I, I, I started getting kind of religious about peeing directly after sex, but I would love to hear from you. How do we prevent UTIs and then how do we treat them? So UTI stands for urinary tract infection. And this is an infection either within the urethra or within the bladder, or sometimes it can even go higher than that and get into the kidneys. We call that pyelonephritis if it goes untreated. In men, the urethra is a lot longer than in women. And so women are prone to urinary tract infections. Um, sexual intercourse obviously kind of stirs up a lot of the vaginal flora, the bacteria within the vagina. Of course, it's right near you know, the rectum. So this is a, a rich zone of lots of different microbial flora and even yeast and viruses and these types of things. And so in women, the urethra is short. And so there's a short passage, you know, only about a centimeter sometimes from the outside world into the inside world. Now our body has normal defenses. So a lot of the predominant bacteria in a vagina, for instance, is lactobacillus. Lactobacillus makes lactic acid and it keeps the pH of the vagina and of the urethra and the bladder actually very acidic. And so that's supposed to keep bad bacteria at bay for a variety of reasons, intercourse, condom use, lubrication use, um, just high colony counts of certain bacteria, you can get infections. Now, the thing that you really want to make sure is sexually transmitted infections. So things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, we're seeing a huge increase in syphilis right now. Mm. And then a newer um, sexually transmitted infection called mycoplasma genitalium. Um, there's not a lot of uh, widely available testing for it, but it is an STI. So sometimes it's not necessarily a bladder infection. You want to make sure it's actually not like, you know, an STD that needs treated because a lot of these are very easily treated. But it's just the fact that there's a lot of bacteria there. There's not a lot of great evidence that peeing after sex decreases, you know, getting UTIs. Um, the other thing is women who are perimenopausal or postmenopausal, when you lose your estrogen, um, you lose the plumpness and lubrication of those cells around the urethra, and you're way more prone to UTIs. So older women, a lot of times, will get them after intercourse because, for that reason as well. Um, but if you're getting them recurrently, there's something. There could be something wrong, you know, with your your microbiome essentially. And so you want to get checked out. Make sure it's not something that you could be passing to your partner. Um, and some people get them so frequently that we put them on what we call postcoital prophylaxis. So they just take like one dose of an antibiotic after every sexual encounter. Um, but you have to be careful with that because excessive antibiotic use certainly has its own downstream implications. Sure. So are you saying that the, the, the way to prevent them if you're getting them often is to like, well, go and see a gynecologist for one. They'll probably prescribe you an antibiotic. Is there anything else that we can do? Can we stay hydrated, uh, eat enough salt, for instance? I don't know if minerals have anything to do with it, but I, I'm just guessing. Well, the, yeah. Um, so the vagina is a self-cleansing organ. So you actually want to make sure you're not putting like no, like, um, you know, scented. There's so many of these like feminine hygiene products that actually can really mess up your vaginal microbiome. So you don't want to be using like douches. You don't want to be, uh, putting scented products and, and soaps and all these things there. 
certainly just washing after intercourse and just maintaining normal hygiene. But if you're getting an infection, just get tested and actually know what it is because sometimes it's not actually an infection and you don't want to take antibiotics if you don't need them. But it could be the, you know, it could be the pH of your urine. I mean, obviously all the things to take care of yourself, like eat a good diet, you know, all those things affect our, our general health and our immune system because that's essentially what this is, you know. Our immune system should be able to keep those invaders at bay by themselves. Yeah, got it. Now, I feel like a lot of people will think, well, because the the vagina needs a certain pH, they're going to drink, you know, pH, the, that, that pH water, whatever that's called, alkaline water. That's trash, right? <laughs> it's total trash. And I shared on a story one day, I t- had pH strips in my office and I was sticking them in the water. It was supposed to be this like alkaline water and it was not alkaline at all. Right. Well, like, if it's come from a plastic bottle, it probably has microplastics in it as well. Like, yeah, exactly. But every part of your body, like your blood, your vagina, your bladder, your liver, they all have a different pH. Like the body knows what it's doing and it has mechanisms to acidify or alkalinize those areas. Mm-hmm. And there's no evidence that drinking alkaline water is going to change the pH of your vagina. There's there's zero evidence for that. Good. It I'm so glad go you said that because I think that's very useful information with everyone out there buying their pH alkaline water, thinking that they're so cool. Uh, just so you know, according to Dr. Jamie Seaman, it's trash. Good to know. Yeah. Well, and the other thing women will find in the feminine hygiene aisle is boric acid. It's become widely available over the counter now, and it's used for treating like recurrent bacterial vaginosis, like a bacterial infection within the vagina. You just, you know, think, oh, I'll just put these boric acid pills in there and it'll make it acidic and it'll fix everything. And honestly, um, there are some studies that where it is indicated, but it it can make things worse too. And it's very dangerous. It's actually lethal if you ingest it orally. So you just want to be really careful about, you know, what you're putting in there and and knowing why you're, why you're doing that. But yeah, taking something orally, like different foods, not going to help the vagina. Got it. Well, I feel like while while we're on this subject, um, one of the questions I found funny just because of the, the wording of it, this is somebody else asking this. How do I stop my vagina from having a bad pong to it? <laughs> I feel like they're from so, Australia because pong is like, <laughs> it means it stinks. I just love well, pong. Sorry. I think it's such a great word. Anyway, yes. How do we, how can somebody treat that? Yeah, so definitely not a medical term, but the I think there's this misconception that the vagina is sterile and odorless. The vagina, like I said, has normal microbial species yeast viruses in it like i said it's supposed to be self-cleansing it it will have an odor to it like everybody has a natural scent like just like your armpits have a scent just like your skin has a scent the vagina has like a normal scent certainly when the microbial balance gets off specifically when we see something like bacterial vaginosis where we see a predominance of these other bacteria like gardnerella um it will actually have like an amine odor and that's from the nitrogen. So that's where we test the pH and the pH has gotten a little bit high or sometimes people will describe it as a fishy odor. Oh, and that's a problem because when sometimes that, women- Sorry to interrupt. Amine would be when it's a kind of a seafoody smell. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it can sometimes be very pungent. And so, but but just because you have a scent to your vagina doesn't mean you have an infection. So it may just be a completely normal scent. Now, obviously when you have intercourse, if you're using condoms, lubrications, spermicides, all of these things can transiently change, you know, the scent and odor of your discharge, but the vagina is not odorless and that is completely normal. It's not gross. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing that you should be, you know, uh, self-conscious about, but certainly you can see infections that cause a more fishy type odor and you want to make sure you test for that. Right. So in short, when a person is feeling like they've got a bit more of a, uh, a smell than usual, what do you think that they should do? Get tested. <laughs> right. You want to test the pH of the vagina and actually see if the pH is, so there's really, there's three criteria to diagnose. Now we're seeing more like DNA based testing where it's just like, quick little swab, you can get an answer within 12 to 24 hours. But really, uh, traditionally, there was three things we looked at. They're called Amstel's criteria. 
and that's a high pH because it's supposed to be acidic. So a high pH, um, an amine odor. So we can actually take KOH and we can mix it with a swab from the vagina and it will actually increase that amine odor. So literally in my gynecology office, I'm smelling test tubes. Sometimes just doing the vaginal exam, most well-trained gynecologists can stick in a speculum and sometimes we can just smell it immediately. Um, if the infection's really bad, you can smell it without doing a pelvic exam. I mean, you can get really robust, you know, pungent odors from the vagina. Um, actually, the worst one I'll tell you in a second. But, and then the third Please. criteria is something called um, clue cells. So we actually take a swab from the vagina. We rub the swab on a glass slide. We look under the microscope and you'll see these little clusters of bacteria that are stuck onto the squamous cells of the, of the vaginal. The squamous cells are the cells that come from the vagina. So those are the three criteria, and you need two out of the three to get the diagnosis. So it's not something you can really diagnose at home. And like I said, you may do the testing and it's normal, but you want to make sure it's not an STD or something else like that. So unfortunately, you do need to see see your provider, but the worst odor. That's what I want to ask. Tell me about the worst odor that you've smelled as a gynecologist. I mean, you can, you can get, you know, pretty bad infections. You know, um, I've seen some really, really, um, angry vaginas with like trichomonas. That's like a really inflammatory STD, but angry sometimes vaginas. Have no symptoms at all, but, <laughs> but the worst, okay. the worst is probably retained objects or retained tampons that, um, you know, not intentionally have been in there for days or weeks or months or longer and a retained tampon that's been in there for a long time um is usually festering with a lot of bacteria <laughs> oh yeah wow i feel sorry for the person so. i feel sorry for you i feel sorry for everybody involved in that situation yeah no it's i mean it's a horrible thing for the patient too yeah and we you know are so supportive as a provider it's not the first time we've seen it it's not the last time we'll see it but yeah. Have you ever pulled out anything strange from a vagina that you weren't expecting? Um, yes, I, um, well, retained tampons, a lot of times people think that they have a mass. I had a lady that was referred during my residency. She was told that she had cancer. She had a, a like a cervical cancer, a uterine cancer. And, um, I went in, we did this like hour long interview, looked at the CT images, and then I put the speculum in and I see this mass and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the cancer. I'm like going to biopsy it. And I pulled out a retained tampon, but I've had a colleague who, uh, had a colleague that removed a frog from a vagina. Um, it's like a, it's mostly David was, Blaine's girlfriend, that magician who, who like swallows frogs. Yeah. You know, the story goes that, um, <laughs> Her and her husband were out boating and um, she got drunk on a sandbar and passed out. And apparently oh. he put a frog in her vagina oh. and forgot as a joke and forgot about it. Um, That's amazing. Um, but sometimes, you no know, um, bottle caps. I mean, um, it's, in, it's funny what people will sometimes put in their vagina. But sometimes with sexual abuse cases too, we see weird things like in the cervix or in the uterus, um, it's, you gotta be careful. Wow. You, you, be careful. you really just brought me down to earth. I was having so much fun and then, yeah, but you're absolutely <laughs> correct. I mean, I, that must be dreadful to see when it's but an abuse case. The vagina, I could tell a lot of stories about things in people's rectums. Um, somebody tagged me in Joe Rogan had a post recently about, um, something that was in a woman's bladder. Oh, and yeah, I got some questions I was about like, this. I didn't know what it was in reference to. It was this. Yeah, some people, it was a, something like a tumbler or? Yeah, it was like a glass. It was like literally like, I think like a glass tumbler. <laughs> um. And that's in an asshole? That's in a butthole? No, they found it in the bladder. So, so it's there's gone up only through the vagina. Plausible, there's only two plausible explanations. Um, you can dilate the urethra. And I actually one time was in a sex shop actually here in my town, we were, went to a music concert and my husband and I walked around this sex shop because we had parked in front of it. And in the back, there was this crazy room, like a BDSM, there's leather and whips and chains. And they had a glass, like a jewelry case. And this woman came up and she said, do you know what these things are? And they were 
stainless steel, they were urethral dilators. Like we would use them in surgery to dilate actually a cervix. And she, I was like, those are Hagar dilators. Like she didn't know I was a gynecologic, like a yeah. gynecologic surgeon. And she's like, what? She's like, no, those are urethral dilators. I was like, well, I'd be really careful sticking those in a urethra. Like you could puncture your urethra or your bladder or, and so then she starts asking me all these questions about urethral dilation. And it's not something I would recommend unless you want to be incontinent of urine. Um, yeah. Can I, can I ask you, I've, I've, I, I need to clarify other... this urethra you've mentioned a few times. What is the urethra? Is that the, what I would call the vagina? No, 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 no. Okay. Good question, Luke. Thank you for asking for clarity. The urethra is the tube that empties the bladder of urine. So in men, your semen and your urine both come out of your urethra. So the tube right inside the penis. In a woman, you have um, you have anus. Then above that, you have vaginal opening. Then above that, you have the urethra. And then above that, you have the clitoris. So the urethra is where a woman pees from, where her pee comes out. Got it. So it would be at the so top this, of the vaginal opening. It would be right above the vaginal opening, not in the vagina. If you actually spread the labia, you can look at it. So, I mean, if, if Kara wants to show you her urethra tonight, you could find it. It's, I've, after this conversation, um, it's going to get educational the next time I go in. <laughs> but the other plausible way that the, that the glass could have gotten into the bladder is through a fistula. So sometimes like the woman could have had the glass in her vagina and it eroded through the vaginal wall and into the bladder. So that's another way that objects can end up where they're not supposed to be if they've been there for a really long time. And like I said, unfortunately, we've seen that in like abuse cases or people with decreased mental capacity, sometimes like in group homes and things like that, um, they'll just put things in different places in their body. And I mean, we all experimented. Kind of, yeah, I love the use of that, that, that phrase a decreased mental capacity. I'm going to start using that. It's so politically correct, but it explains so about, so about it, it, it explains so many people, doesn't it? Yeah. Just people, well, people with cognitive impairment, because I'm not even talking about younger kids. Like I've seen, we had a woman come in, um, who had dementia and she had taken a pen cap. She had a vulvar problem. Like it was very itchy. Like she had a skin condition ah. and she was using a pen cap to itch her labia mm -hmm. and she had, messed around and pushed and prodded so much that she had inserted the pen cap into her urethra and it was in her bladder. Wow. So yeah, That's sometimes amazing. I'm really well, trying to hold back physically from not there. like, you know, not vomiting or anything. I just like want to like hold my eyes. Some and... people are aroused by pain. So sometimes people push things too far. And... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 my next question is, uh, um, somebody asked about variations of sizes of labia. What is considered normal? So labia come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, both the labia majora and the minora. So the minora is like the thinner lip, you know, of the vulva and the labia majora is the, the one that has a little bit more fat in it and they come in different colors different textures. I mean, they, they're they all normal, to be honest. Um, labiaplasty is, of course, this thing now because women think that it should look like, I've heard descriptions, like a cute little peach or whatever. But honestly, you want to be really careful doing any sort of plastic surgery because we discussed how the vulva, the labia are actually very important for arousal. Um, you know, they like, if you're having penetrative intercourse, like the the penis is like pulling the labia back and forth and it's creating stimulation of the clitoris. And so, um, it, they're normal and they, it doesn't, some people don't think that the labia minora should hang out like more than the majora. And certainly sometimes we'll see if sometimes if woman has like one side is bigger than the other, sometimes like with exercise, they can get a lot of friction on their clothing, like their, you know, yoga leggings or something, or sometimes, riding a bike, they can actually, you know, get a lot of friction and, and that would be an indicated reason to perform like a reduction labiaplasty. Um, but from an aesthetic perspective, you just want to be really careful if you're, if you're cutting or removing any tissue, but just like people's faces, just like people's breasts and their hair, like they come in different sizes and shapes and colors and that's completely normal. You should like take a mirror and look 
and see what yours look like. And love it. And don't cut into it. Don't don't yeah, go and get surgery cool. aesthetically. It's all okay. It's normal. You heard it here first. Dr. Jamie Seaman, she thinks your pussy is perfectly fine. <laughs> it is fabulous. It's it's perfectly fit and fabulous. We love all colors. We love all the shapes. Leave it alone. You don't see men having plastic surgery on their penises. <laughs> there are men having plastic surgery on their penises for sure, right? Well, just trying to make it larger. <laughs> trying to make it larger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, but I just wanted to, I think that's very important information because so many questions were about that sort of thing. And I, I feel like, you know, with the, like you said, the, the, the amount of people who are going and getting vaginoplasty, labiaplasty, whatever you would call it, that's skyrocketed over the last 20 years, hasn't it? Yeah, we're seeing a lot more of it and a lot more of it at a younger age. And so, and, you know, sometimes I think it's hard to turn people down when they're like, no, I want giant breasts and smaller labia. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I just think from a sexual function perspective, you have to make sure that you're adequately counseled, that you could have pain postoperatively. You could have pain with intercourse. You could have a reduction in lubrication. You could have no more orgasms. Like if you accidentally sever the nerves to the clitoris, like it is plausible, like it could happen. You could have complications, you could have scarring. And so people need to hear that these are possible outcomes, especially in a surgeon, you know, you better know who's doing your surgery and how much they've done and like, how do they do it? And like, I mean, cause, um, it's, it's a big deal. That's like, don't, don't go to a foreign country to get labiaplasty. <laughs> yeah, that's I think look, I think that's super important information. So I'm so I'm very glad that you said that. Uh, I have a question here. Can vaginas wither from a lack of sexual activity? Um, so your tissues are kind of I mean, yes, we could describe it as use it or lose it, like a lot of things, right? Uh -huh. Like if you don't your bicep curls, you lose your biceps. So yeah, so like the pelvic floor. Um, if you, you know, aren't having regular intercourse, um, it, sometimes it can get tight. Um, the vaginal tissue, um, women will describe like if they only have intercourse once or twice a year, sometimes they can have pain just because there's not as much, you know, lubrication. I think a lot of times it's just inadequate arousal. Um, and then as women lose estrogen, after you go through menopause and you lose estrogen, the vagina starts to shrink so it actually the the skin gets thinner on um, the vaginal opening like in very 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 postmenopausal women the vaginal opening can be very small um it's almost like you know when you're born as a little girl and then i mean it's really the vagina is the largest when you're going through your years of fertility and bearing children and things like that but yeah it's um it's if you if you want to have penetrative intercourse you have to continue to use it and we see that a lot with like cancer patients, like who go through pelvic radiation. We actually give them dilators to continue to use because if they want to have intercourse, they have to make sure that tissue stays stretched out and stays healthy. Um, if you have problems, you know, maybe maybe you got divorced and you haven't had sex in years and you meet a new partner, um, pelvic floor physical therapy is a great way if you, you know, um, want to get back into, you know, using your sex organs again. But there's also like, we use sound wave therapy, you know, like gains wave. I've heard about and, gains wave. Uh, what do you think about gains laser? wave? There's all sorts of things you can do to like stimulate that tissue again. I want to talk about gains wave because that's the first time I've ever heard someone other than Dave Asprey talk about it. Um, what do you think of gains wave? Well, so it's sound, it's sound wave therapy is what it is. And they um, are now using it on women. Um, it's called Femi wave and Basically, when you send the sound waves through the tissue, you know, through the, the penis, through the clitoris, through the labia, even inside the vagina, the sound waves are basically stimulating blood flow, neurogenesis, you know, you're, you're moving, you're dilating the blood vessels. And so it is a way that you can kind of stimulate that tissue. It's like, a you know, kind of like working out the tissue a little bit to, um, you know, I don't know that there's like obviously I don't have a penis. I can't speak for gains wave and I've never had sound wave therapy to my own vulva, but, um, I, I think it's plausible from a physiologic perspective that if you're doing a treatment that increases blood flow and neurogenesis and, you know, keeping the nerves, cause that's what orgasm is, you know, 
the pelvic floor, you want lubrication, you want blood flow, and you want nerves that are working. Like that's how you send the signal back to your brain that this feels good. So anything that supports, you know, the cardiovascular system of the penis or the vagina or the clitoris and, and all the nerve fibers, you know, I, so the treatment, I have no the treatment ends in like better genital health or uh, better, bigger orgasms. What does it do? Yeah, basically better orgasms. Uh, Gaines Wave was originally marketed for like erectile dysfunction. Mm. So, you know, you blast the penis with these sound waves. And in men too, you know, we think of the penis as an external structure, but part of the penis actually, just like in women, the clitoris is actually internal. So like at the base of the penis, they would take the Gaines Wave and, you know, kind of pound these sound waves into the base there because there is an internal portion of the penis. And so, uh, yes, it's for basically, you know, better erections, better orgasms, same thing in women. Obviously we don't have an external organ, you know, the clitoris externally is very small. So it's not like someone's going to look and be like, oh, she doesn't have a good erection, but from a sexual function arousal perspective, yeah, it could be helpful too for women. Amazing. Um, I want to get into fertility, pregnancy, birth, but let's first talk about contraception because I got so many questions about this. Birth control is incredibly complicated. It seems. Uh, are there form of are there forms of birth control, IUDs, uh, etc., that you tend to recommend? Well, as a side note, there's a new male birth control that they're getting close to approval. I'm interested to know if any men would take it. But um, yeah, birth control. So I kind of think of birth control in three classes. So you have non-hormonal forms of birth control. So these would be barrier methods like condoms, diaphragms, spermicides, withdrawal, abstinence. There is a non-hormonal IUD called Paragard, which is the copper IUD. So there's non-hormonal forms. Then there's combined contraceptives that have both estrogen and progesterone. And these are either pills you take orally, a vaginal ring that you insert into the vagina, or a patch that you place on your skin. And all of these basically turn off your system. They shut down your pituitary gland and your ovary from ovulating. That's how they work. And then the third class is progesterone only. So there's a progesterone only pill, a couple different forms of that. There's a shot that's progesterone only. And then there's progesterone IUDs. Um, The long acting, oh, and then there's a progesterone implant that goes in the arm. Um, The long acting reversible contraception. So like the implants are much more popular these days because it's hard sometimes for people to remember to take something on a daily basis. They don't want to put anything in their vagina or wear a patch on their skin. Um, The ones that contain both estrogen and progesterone, I believe come with the most side effects. Um, There's definitely implications. They can cause micronutrient deficiencies. That's not well known um, because you're having to metabolize additional amounts of hormones. Um, any woman that's been on birth control, I certainly have, knows that they just don't feel right when you turn off your system like that. But thank God we have birth control, you know, and that women get to choose when they want to be pregnant and don't want to be pregnant. So I don't want anybody listening to think that I'm swaying anybody one way or another. Like, if do what you feel is right for you and something that you'll use reliably. Um, I'm a little biased towards IUDs. Patients really love them, especially the progesterone IUDs, because we see a reduction in periods with them. So about an 80% reduction in periods at three months and a 90% reduction with the progesterone IUDs. Um, With the Paragard, with the copper IUD, actually some women can have heavier periods with that one. Probably my, my scientific explanation is copper and zinc compete in the body. And so I think sometimes maybe a copper zinc imbalance can cause heavier bleeding with the copper one or the Paragard one. Um, But they do have to be inserted with a um, exam in the office. We actually place them like through the cervix. So they're inside the uterus. You shouldn't know that it's there once it's in there. And they come in three, five and 10 year varieties. So that's kind of nice for like, if somebody's done having babies or they know they don't want a kid for five years. Um, Then The vaginal rings, there's some newer ones out. Um, There's actually a new FDA approved one that's good for a year called Anavera. Um, It's just really patient preference, but you have to understand that there's side effects with all of them. Like the injectable progesterone, for instance, can demineralize your bone, (laughs) increase risk of osteopenia. So it's, gosh, it's hard for women because I think that we really put the burden of contraception on women in this world um, and not on men. And so um, it will be interesting in the next, I mean, the problem with male birth controls in the past is that 
tanks people takes tanks men's testosterone. Right. Uh, and it seems very popular you know, nowadays like to have high testosterone as a man. So like, how are you going to get men to stop, you know, to be willing to like let their testosterone drop when we know that it's so great for yeah, mood, for muscle, for brain, like, you know, what are we going to do? Yeah. And then women, when they go on a birth control pill, it increases sex hormone binding globulin and it binds their free testosterone. You want to tank a woman's libido, put her on birth control pills. Wow. So it's just, I don't know. I just think it's a little kind of unfair sometimes the burden we put on women, but thank God we have birth control. Um, if you really want my honest opinion, the best birth control out there is a vasectomy. And my husband has openly shared on social media that that's what we chose after we had our third daughter. So no, there's no more fit and fabulous babies coming. Uh, um, <laughs> well, that's, I mean, but that sounds, you're, you've absolutely nailed it. That's very true. Like vasectomies are the best probably safest option and the one that messes with your hormones the least, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. So you can also do a tubal, like you can take out a woman's tubes, but it's less invasive to do a vasectomy. It's an easy little in office procedure. It's super easy to tie a woman's tubes. I have to put her under anesthesia and take her to the operating room. So, I mean, um, if you want something non-hormonal, that's, that's very effective. Um, now they're never a hundred percent, uh, tubules can fail. Vasectomies can fail. IUDs can fail. Um, I've even seen a case report where a woman had a hysterectomy, but she still had her ovaries and sperm somehow got through the vagina and like the pregnancy implanted inside her belly. I mean, we've seen the craziest things ever. If you still have ovaries and testicles, you can get pregnant. Yeah. Wow. That was, that's some, um, like angry sperm. It really wanted to get there. <laughs> Um, I, I, what do you think of neem oil? As a contraceptive? As a natural contraceptive. I've heard about, heard it talked about. I got a couple of questions about it. Um, yeah. What do you think? I mean, there's, so there's a new neem oil. I haven't looked at the data. I wouldn't know the data if it's actually been studied or if it's, but, um, there is a new birth control out called Fexi that is, um, basically like a lactic acid gel and you just squirt it into the vagina like an hour before intercourse. And, um, but it's not as effective. I mean, I think in the trials it was like maybe 70 or 80% effective. So I guess if you combined it with like withdrawal or a condom or something, it would be more effective, but that's the problem. Like something like neem oil. I mean, it might decrease it a little bit. Mm. Oh, and then the one we haven't talked about is actually, um, some people call it natural family planning or cycle mapping. My only caveat with that one is you have to have very regular cycles and how it works is basically you track on your phone, on your smart app. I've got a, you know, app on my phone. I track my cycle. Um, you either avoid intercourse when you're supposed to be ovulating or you use a backup method like condoms. Now I'll tell you, there's a couple days of the month when women really want to be having sex and that's around ovulation. I mean, that's when their testosterone is naturally, you know, peaking. And so I'd hate to have to have a woman avoid sex when she wants it the most, mm -hmm. just not get pregnant, <laughs> but you could use the backup method too. But yeah, I'm just, I think neem oil is probably in that lesser effective. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's so funny, this idea of squirting something into the vagina to help with contraception, which we just talked about, you know, men are much more spontaneously aroused and women are, what was the phrase that you used? They have responsive desire. So if like the dishes are done, kids are in bed, mm. the candles are lit, you, you know, caress her, that's responsive desire. She's like, oh, this is, or, or a great example is she sits down on the couch and starts reading 50 shades of gray. And all of a sudden she's aroused and like wants to have sex or she went to magic Mike and now she's all hot and bothered. I mean, like that's, that's responsive desire. Like, oh, I saw something or I heard something or I smelled something and now I want that versus men just like walking around with spontaneous desire. Like they just woke up and they're like, it's Monday. I want to have sex today. Right. So what I'm saying is this responsive desire, like, and then putting it on women, like to squirt a neem oil or that fexy thing into themselves. It's like, well, yeah, but you're not taking into consideration the fact that you, well, it's, it's, it's actually, it might work for women. It's like, oh, actually in an hour, I might want to have sex in an hour. I will have sex. Whereas a man's like, I'm going to have sex now. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like women don't want to have sex because there are some women with raging libidos yeah. and maybe they were like going out on Friday night to the bar and mm -hmm. 
keep it in their purse and <laughs> put it in there an hour before they, I don't know, meet the Tinder guy. Love it. But if you want to talk about something that's worse, there is a FDA approved medication for low libido, for low sexual desire in women. And it's an injectable medication. You're supposed to stab yourself in, in the thigh 30 minutes before you want to have sex. Um, and it has almost a 50% rate of nausea. So wow. Like, so you're either going to get nauseous or horny. I don't want to have sex. But I'm going to inject myself and then 50-50, I'm either going to be puking or we're going to be having sex. <laughs> um, I'm so glad we talked about that. I had so many questions about that. How, how, do, how do you handle, how should a woman handle going off the pill? Because there are a lot of women, you know, coming on it, getting on it, getting off it. How to best handle getting off the pill? Well, you can just, you can stop the pill at any, there's not like a special way to get off of it. Just stop but it. But I guess where the question would be like, like how to balance hormones again, it can really like throw, spin mm, a woman, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, most of the like supplements out there, it's all garbage. Once again, it's attacking women. Like there's something wrong with their body. Essentially, when you come off birth control, you will start ovulating again, usually within a month or two based on good studies. But certainly, like I said, the, the combined pill that has estrogen and progesterone, it can cause B vitamin deficiencies, magnesium, zinc, selenium. It can cause oxidative stress. So you want to make sure you're eating whole food diet, nutrient-dense animal foods. You're getting sleep. You're getting sunlight because those things are what stimulate your you know, growth hormone and sex hormone production. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to do everything you can to support your just overall metabolic health. That's going to... like balance your hormones. Yeah. I want to talk more about that because that's great advice for getting off the pill, but let's talk more about diet supplementation. Um, let's talk diet supplementation for fertility. Yeah. So your sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, they're all made from cholesterol and fat is like so vilified in the diet these days and low fat diets were promoted for so long. And low fat diets cause infertility in men and women. Um, so do vegan, vegetarian, um, or very, very, very high fiber plant-based diets. They can actually not only drive your estrogen down, they can, they can make you excrete so much estrogen in your poop that you can become infertile. So if you want to eat a diet for fertility, you want to be eating nutrient dense animal foods with lots of good fat in it because that cholesterol is what, what your hormones are made from. And then you want to be getting sunlight. You want to be getting adequate sleep. There's also a lot of key micronutrients for making sperm like zinc and B vitamins. Um, for healthy ovulation, you need the same thing. Um, at fertilization, there's this something called a zinc spark that happens where like billions of little zinc atoms and calcium are released. So like oysters are fantastic for fertility to get a lot of zinc in your diet, but things like beef, eggs, um, you know, dairy organ meats, if you like them, they're very, very good for fertility. That's fantastic. That's great information. What do you think about, um, what's great is the, supplementing and, and diet during pregnancy. Is there anything different to what you just mentioned, or is it basically just that again? Yeah. So I just recorded an entire podcast on this with Lily Nichols. She wrote a book called Real Food for Pregnancy. I know Lily. Real Food for yeah. Gestational Diabetes. She's awesome. And um, yes, pregnancy nutrition is, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, the guidelines that OBGYNs are given are, in my opinion, a little inaccurate. Um, people are eating, you know, 50 to 60% of their diet from carbohydrates and mathematically, if you're eating 50 to 60% of your calories from carbohydrates or grains, you know, plants, rice, there's no mathematical way that you could be getting the nutrients that you need to grow a healthy baby. Um, babies need DHA. They need choline. That fat literally is what builds their nervous system in their brain. And so if you're, if you're, first of all, protein is, is important, but if you're talking about just energy, calories, fat, or carbs, if you're, if you're, increasing carbs and you're decreasing fat, right? So you're, it's always a trade-off. If you're not, if you're going to avoid one macronutrient, you're going to be eating more of the other. And so in my personal opinion, you have got to make sure because protein and fat are essential macronutrients. You, you cannot live without them. Carbohydrates, 
are actually non-essential for human life. Does that mean you should eat zero? Probably not. But um, you can make as many carbs and glucose in your body that you need from adequate protein and fat substrates. So if you want to talk about building a human baby, um, and it's so important because you want to actually optimize your DNA. You want to optimize your egg and sperm production before you get pregnant. If you're trying to like suddenly figure this stuff out in the middle of pregnancy, um, you're behind the eight ball a little bit um, because DNA methylation happens in pregnancy. So nutrient deficiencies, lack of sunlight, poor sleep in pregnancy, all this stuff is coding your baby's DNA and how you know that baby will survive and what that baby's risk is of cancer and diabetes in their lifetime. So you know, pregnancy nutrition is a big deal. Um, also making sure that you're not exposing yourself to tons of chemicals, pesticides, a lot of that, you know, we find with plant foods, but even things like cosmetics and lotions and soaps, those things act as endocrine disruptors. They can mess with estrogen receptors. And so, yeah, it's a super big deal what a, what a pregnant woman eats. Yeah, I love that information. Um, I have a question. How to train my vagina back to normal after birthing an alien? I just assume they mean their child. Do you think that that would just be pelvic floor, like getting pelvic yeah. floor therapy? Yeah, time and pelvic PT, pelvic PT for sure. Do it. I think ever, I wish, I wish our medical system was set up where women, you know, had the baby and were seeing the pelvic floor physical therapist like right away. A lot of them will want your OBGYN to sign off. You know, they won't see you for maybe six weeks after birth mm. to just let the vagina heal because you know you could have a laceration or something from the delivery, and you want to make sure that heals before anybody's doing some sort of manual therapy. But yeah, um, my wife. Kara is, she's over 30. So when we had Chaplin, she was labeled a geriatric mother. Do you think it's harder for women to get pregnant as they age? And then is it harder for them to carry and then birth and then recover? Well, actually 35 is the cutoff for advanced maternal age. And um, they, they had to pick a number, right? Somewhere where the cutoff was higher risk and lower risk. So after the age of 35, there is the... Um, you know, higher rates of infertility, higher rates of babies born with genetic problems, higher rates of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, but certainly their underlying health matters. I mean, I've seen some really healthy 40 year olds and I've seen some really unhealthy 22 year olds. Yeah. So it really just kind of depends, you know, what the mom's underlying metabolic health is when it comes to maybe what her risk is with getting pregnant having a healthy pregnancy and delivery. That's super interesting. So metabolic health, like you just mentioned there as like the marker for how healthy a person is. Metabolic health is like, would be, how could you affect your metabolic health via diet and like the way that you live your life, exercise, et cetera? Would you say that? Well, so basically the power source inside of our cells is our mitochondria. Right. So mitochondria basically literally take energy from food we eat, so from ketone production or glucose production, and then also from sunlight. So like plants, for instance, make all of their energy literally through photosynthesis, so from sunlight. But our, our cells also do too. Like we need sunlight for, uh, to activate cholesterol and vitamin D. So when we talk about, you know, when I say the word metabolic health, the downstream ramifications of poor metabolic health would be like high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, cancer, all the metabolic diseases that are most likely going to kill you or make your life miserable. Um, but people can have really subtle, you know, uh, maybe they don't have overt hypertension, you know, high blood pressure, but their mitochondria might not be working efficiently because they are eating, a, you know, not enough nutrients, they're not sleeping, they're not getting sunlight, all the things I've mentioned multiple times. I now. like it though. I, it, it, it's they're getting just so, religious. They're just so undervalued when it comes to our health. And so, Basically, when I say metabolic health is you want your cells to be a very, very efficient factory if they're going to have to build another human being. And you want to make sure that there's adequate parts there. So protein, I always think of protein as like the little Lego blocks, like you're going to build a little Lego block man, like you better make sure there's enough little Lego parts there. Because if there's not, your body's just going to go take chunks of your bicep and your quadricep to build the baby. Like it will take whatever it wants from the mom. And that's at the mom's expense. It'll leach calcium from your bones and make you, you know, osteoporotic. 
And so that's why a diet is so important because you don't want to be a frail, broken mom, you know, trying to raise a raise another human. So, so that's why eating like a lot of nutrients is super yeah. important. And I mean, I'd, I'd say that like calorie counting around pregnancy is like got to be trash, right? We've got to be getting as much nutrients in as possible. Well, yeah, because you could be eating 2,300 calories of garbage that don't have any nutrients. Right. And that's essentially what carbs are. I mean, you know, it's very energy dense, but it's not nutrient dense. Like if you put, you know, a cup of rice next to like one ounce of liver, like the liver doesn't have very many calories at all, but it has loads of nutrients. Whereas a cup of rice would have a ton of calories and not as many nutrients. And so it's really the nutrient density of the food that you should be focusing on and not necessarily the calories. Because if you're eating a lot of fat and protein, it will provide adequate satiety. You're not going to overeat. You're going to be getting tons of nutrients. I love all this information. You're just a wealth of knowledge. I, I reckon I could talk to you for three hours, but, um, I want to know, I want everyone to know, how do we, how do we follow your journey? How do we, um, I know you've got a book hard to kill coming out. I want to hear a little bit about that, but tell me, tell me about the book and tell us how to find you social media. Like how do we get on board the Jamie Seaman train? Yeah, you can find me on both Facebook and Instagram, Dr. Fit and Fabulous. And I've got a website, drfitandfabulous.com, but I'm writing this new book called Hard to Kill, and it will come out, we're hoping June 1st, maybe July 1st at the, at the latest. And it is a book, a little bit about my story. I essentially, you know, I went into medicine, met my husband in college, but I had these three pregnancies and I was not doing all the things that I told you guys to do on the podcast today and <laughs> ended up with poor metabolic health and pre-diabetes and kind of set out on a mission to um, fix those things. I had a bad tragedy that happened in my life. You'll get to read about that in the book. And um, I have five pillars that I really believe make a human hard to kill. And that's what we eat, how we move, how we sleep, kind of our mindset and stress resilience, and then like our environment. And so the book goes through the five pillars and teaches you know, you, the basics of what you need to know. And at the end of the book, we have a 30 day hard to kill challenge that will kind of allow you to start implementing these things into your life. Um, we'll have an entire online hard to kill community, a hard to kill Academy where you'll be able to consume lots of other videos with like tons of knowledge. Like I, the one thing I really want people to understand about this book is although I am a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist, boarded in integrative medicine, boarded in ketogenic nutrition therapy. This is not some like stuffy white coat. Like I cited all my 4,000, nothing is cited in the book, by the way, nothing. Like it's not, it's not a super scientific book. Like it is written at the level of like me, Jamie Seaman as a human. Like I am just as human as all of my patients. And there's a lot of backward things in medicine. There's a lot of politics and nutrition right now. And I didn't want the whole focus of the book to be on that, but I just want people to understand that you're going to have to start to be your own expert and you're going to have to start to figure these things out because it takes about 17 years for a study to be completed and then to become part of like evidence-based medicine. Well, uh, my kids and I don't have time for that. Yeah, <laughs> but I'll be dead. I'll be dead by the time we figure this all out. Yeah. So hard to kill really is just um, doing it for yourself and it's, it's the subtitle of the book is um, mastering the mindset to maximize your years. So I just want to be able to live a really long life. I want to be able to live to a hundred. I want to be able to do all the things that I want to do in those hundred years. And I just want to be hard to kill. And I hope there's a whole bunch of people that want to come do it with me. And uh, it's going to be fun. Well, send me the book when it's ready. I want to read it. Maybe we can have you back on. We can talk about what's going on in the book, all this information. Cause I, I know that we could just go on and on and on and we, and we have so much more to talk about. And I know I'm going to get a flood of questions after this podcast, just from talking to you. You are a true legend. I love your mind, the way it works. I love everything that's in there. I want to get it all out. Um, so there you have a Dr. Jamie Seaman or Dr. Fit and Fabulous. She's got an awesome podcast. I've been on there. Check her out on Instagram, Facebook, and in July, the book's coming, right? Yes, I'll send you a signed copy. Oh, damn. I love that. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamie Seaman. Thanks, Luke. 
You're a legend.